Hey, well, good evening, everybody. As Charles said, my guy, um, my name is Jermaine, associate pastor at our Sterling congregation. The lights are bright, so I can't see any Sterlingites up in the house. But do we have any people from Sterling here tonight? Come on. Sterling, that's the place flowing with milk and honey. It's a land that's rich. Um, If you want to know what a holy people look like, man, grab one of those people that screamed and just get to know them. So I'm not biased, just a little bit. So anyway, but I'm grateful to be here. If you've been in this series, it's been a really amazing, awesome series. And I am grateful to have the opportunity to uh, kind of close us out tonight talking about life happening in the lobby. And so we're going to go ahead and hop right in. I feel like I have a lot to say. And so as long as we're not here for like an hour and a half, I'm, uh, I'm going to try my best to get us out of here pretty quickly. But I want God to speak tonight. And I feel like God has a word for all of us here in this place. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, what we do in Sterling is when we actually stand up for the word when we give the word in the beginning. So if you wouldn't mind with me as we stand in reverence to the reading of God's word tonight, we're going to stand here. As I read it out loud, we're going to be going from Acts 2, 44 through 47. And it says this, it says, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I'm going to be teaching tonight from a title, Full House. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for this people, for your presence here. And God, I pray that you would speak through me tonight. And it wouldn't be my voice that people would hear tonight, but it would be your voice that we would be changed, that we would be transformed, that we would be pricked to the heart, and that we, we would be moved to get closer to you tonight. And we would be moved to get closer to one another. So God, I thank you for what you're going to speak tonight. God, be here in this place. Holy Spirit, come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Full house. If you like me, I, I mean, well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm 40 years old, so... I'm a child of the 90s, so I grew up, like most children of the 90s, with this thing that happened on Friday nights, and it was called TGIF. Thank God it's Friday. And we had a whole host of shows that we watched on Friday night, and my family, the classics, that's right, Family Matters, Step by Step, Perfect Strangers, right? You guys remember those shows? And one of those shows was called Full House, right? They have a a show on Netflix called Fuller House. It's not the same, right? (laughs) But Fuller House, we grew up watching that every Friday from 8 o'clock to 10 p.m. as a family, we get together. And Fuller House was this show about this this widowed father named Danny. He had three kids, DJ, who I just found out her name was Donna Jo. Did you guys know that? Wow. (laughs) I know why they called her DJ. Um, So DJ, I think it was... Stephanie and Michelle. And so he had, see, y'all, you guys grew up. That's right. All right. So you guys know what I'm talking about. So they had the three children. He had the three children. And then he was widowed. So he enlisted his, his brother-in-law, Jesse, who was a smooth kind of playboy kind of guy. Played, he was a musician. He enlisted him and he enlisted his best friend, Joey, to help him raise his three daughters. And they had this really crazy friend across the street, or I don't know where she's from. She's always at the house, Kimmy, right? You guys remember Kimmy? Like, where were her parents, right? <laughs> Somebody call Child Protective Services. Who knows? But there was, there was Kimmy. But what you saw was in, in this home, there was this family. Everybody from a, from a different perspective, from a different phase of life, kind of different experiences, all kind of living their, their life together. And they were living these shared experiences. And their shared experiences in their life was enhanced by the shared experiences of the others. And this is their full house. It wasn't just a house full of people, but it was a house full of, of, of life that was happening there. And we all got to experience that on a Friday night at eight o'clock every week. 
And it's, it's so crazy that we would huddle up as a family and we would kind of get to share in the experience of, of this full house that they had in this life. That's a, that's a really weird context to say, but that's something that we do here as a church, right? We come together as a family and we huddle up and we get to share in life experiences together. And what I love about this, this, uh, this picture that we get is that the, the world has this understanding of what it, what it means, this fundamental understanding of, of family, of connection, of belonging, right, of community. And that's what we got to see through our TGIF Friday nights, this full spectrum here. And it's something that the world knows is important. It's something that our enemy knows is important, right? That, that community is important. What, what you see is a bunch of communities coming together, a bunch of people kind of coming together, and then you see them popping up all over the place. There are communities for communities. And it's not really right now about if you belong to a community, but it's really what community do you belong to? There are communities for everything. If you are on a sports team and you belong or you identify with a sports team, you can join a community. If you have particular political beliefs, you can hop into a community. If you believe in certain things, you can hop in this community. I mean, there are communities for people that live in communities and communities for people who live in communities that have other communities. I mean, there are communities upon communities. <laughs> if you go on Facebook, you can hop in a Facebook group of any kind that you want. Whatever you identify with, there is a community. I mean, my, my wife is in, she's going to hate me for this, there is a community called the Real House, am I right, the Real Housewives of Loudoun County? <laughs> huh? Oh, the Real Ladies of Loudoun County. Anybody got enough faith to raise their hand? Are you in that group too? <laughs> no? There's communities for communities. But these, these groups are designed to collect people, collect identities. Um, they are designed to bring you into a sense of belonging. And some of these are designed just to inform behavior. Some of these communities are uh, sometimes designed to maybe re reform or modify our behavior. The enemy would like for us to be conformed in our behavior to certain groups, but none of these groups actually have the ability to transform us, have the ability to not only just change our behavior, but actually change our entire identity to transform us, not from just different behavior, but to become a different person altogether. There's only one person, there's only one group, there's only one community, there's only one people that can actually create transformation in your heart, in your soul, in your life, and that is with the community of God's people. And this is where we are. This is the only place where that happens. Now listen, um, Full House showed us this, that if you can watch them on a, on a Friday night and you could be enhanced by watching this family's life in this community, if your life could be enhanced by watching this, if you could join a sports team or, or you could join a political group or you could join any type of Facebook group and your life can be enhanced and you could get connected and you could become a person that's belonging to a group and your life can be enhanced and changed. Look, how much more could your life be enhanced? How much more could you experience the life of God? How much more could you experience the, the fullness of God? How much more could you experience him if you would just get connected to the source and not just the resources of God? And that is what I'm talking about here tonight. I'm talking about getting connected to the source, getting connected to God's people, getting connected to him. And I believe that if we are to connect with God's people, connect with God's house, that we would become a full house, become a full house. You guys are mighty quiet in here tonight. And look, I believe that participation is better than observation. So I grew up where, yeah, so that's what I need tonight. I need some amens, some hallelujahs. I need to know that you are with me tonight because I can't see you, right, from up here. So this is what the early church embodied here. They embodied this in Acts chapter 2. They made intentional decisions and choices, and two of which I'm going to expound on today. The first one I'm going to talk about here is that they made a decision to stay. 
We have to choose to stay. Choosing to stay doesn't start back in this this passage in Acts chapter 2. It actually starts in Acts chapter 1, in the very beginning of Acts. You can see it in the disciples' life. It says this in verses 3 through 5 of chapter 1. It says, It says this, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. And he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. He's talking about Jesus here. And on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You know, real quick, Jesus has commanded them. To, to stay in a place, and he offered them a promise. He says, go to this place, go where I tell you, stay together, and I will give you what you need to fulfill the mission that I'm going to put you on. And the disciples made a decision. They made a decision to obey what God had commanded, and then we see what happens as they obey God's command in Acts chapter 2. In verses 1 through 4, there's the day of Pentecost, and they get baptized in the Spirit, and God God comes through on his promise and fulfills it. And he says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in a place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house while they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Listen, they obeyed and they stayed and they were slayed. And I love this, the fact that they, they, they stayed. And what you see is a promise that is fulfilled as they stayed together. They were in Leadwell for 40 days with Jesus, right? And then they, they spent another week together, kind of in this house, in the upper room. And they, they make it look easy, right? Spending 40 days, 50 days with each other. I mean, but how many of you know that that is not an easy thing to do? Most of us here can't even spend an hour with one another, right? Because it's, it's difficult because we are people. But I, think, but I think there's something here that I just caught as I was studying this passage. Because this was not something that was easy for the disciples. If you look back in Acts chapter 1, Jesus' command is for them to go back to Jerusalem. And you're, you're looking at this and I'm reading this and I'm like, but... Jerusalem was the place that that Jesus was killed. This is a place where most of them had had scattered from because of their association with Jesus. It was a place of of hurt. It was a place of of pain. It was a place where where they were betrayed by one of their best friends. One of their boys basically sold them out, and then he, he has hung himself and killed himself. This is not a place that was easy for them to go back to. This was a place that would have caused some anxiety in their souls, and it's saying, Jesus is saying, go back to Jerusalem. Go back to that place. How hard would that have been for the disciples? And that's the difficulty that they had to face as they are obeying Jesus in this command. Go back to Jerusalem. And I find it that it's in, it's in that place that Jesus has commanded them to go. And he's saying, if you go back to that place, and if you stay in that place, and if you stay together, this is the place where you will find my promise fulfilled. This is the place where you will be filled with my spirit. This is the place where you will find purpose. And this is the place where you will experience growth. This is the place where I'm telling you to go. And that had to have been difficult. And for some of us in this room right now, I know that relationships are not easy. I know that it's difficult. I know that you've been hurt by the church. I know that you've been hurt by others. I know that people have taken your your heart, and they've taken your trust, they've taken your loyalty, and they've balled it up, and they've threw it on the ground, and they've stomped on it, and then they picked it up, and then they stomped on it again, and then they've picked it up, and they've thrown it in the trash, and you're thinking to yourself, the easy decision for me when you talk about community is to stay away. For a lot of us, when we, when we hear, whoo, go linger in the lobby, the first word that comes to our mind is, nope. <laughs> go join a small group. Nope. Not going to do that. Why don't you go join a service team? Nope. Not a chance. Why don't you go connect with this person? Be disciple. No. No. Because really, our, our culture has developed this, 
this attitude of cancellation and divorce. I mean, it's really celebrated to really say no or to push someone away. And this is where most of us live. And I'm not advocating here that, that you sign up for some type of abusive and chaotic and crazy life. But what I am saying is this. What if the uncomfortable place of community, of committing to a people, of lingering in the lobby, of joining a small group, of asking for prayer or coming down front asking for prayer or calling a friend that's on, a, that's on the fringe that you haven't spoken to in a long time and asking them for coffee? What if, even if it, if it hurts and, and you, you were to reach out and to do something and to obey God's command to stay and to linger into community, what if that's the place that you would step into and that would be the place that God would open the door to bring you into purpose, that to bring you into a new place, to bring you into a fulfilled spirit, to bring you into his promise, to bring you into your purpose, to change your life. What if that is the place that God is calling you into? I mean, I think sometimes we, we might see God differently in that place. We might even get healed in that place if we were to choose to stay. Where we can go from an empty house or a half-filled house to a, a full house. Gosh, man, what if the community that you've been running from is the Jerusalem that God is calling you to go to and to stay in? You know, when I, when I was 18, I got saved, radically saved, March 6th of 2000, and uh, on the college campus of UNC, and my brother was there, and there was a bunch of people that were there on the campus that looked like me at this campus ministry. And I went back to NC State uh, and got connected with Victory Campus Ministries through Kings Park, one of our sister churches of every nation. And uh, that camp- campus ministry did not look like me. Some of you caught that and some of you didn't, right? <laughs> You know, I grew, up, I grew up in church, right? I grew up in a predominantly, not predominantly, it was 100% like Southern black <laughs> church. Like, <laughs> I mean, they, if, if someone walked in there that didn't look like, like me, it was, uh, it was a really big accident. They were lost and they were asking for directions to their church down the street. <laughs> but, you know, I grew up with like John P. Key, you know, you know, Jesus is real, you know, all right? You know, Tiffany getting ready to sing it. We're about to get somebody on the keyboards, but you guys know what I'm talking about. Like the last, the last uh, song I remember singing in the choir growing up was, it was the most contemporary song we ever sung, but it was, it was Joyful, Joyful from um, Sister Act. And I didn't do the singing. I did, I did the rap, right? You know what I'm saying? All right, it was crazy. I, c- I can still do the rap today, you know? You want to do it? Y'all are crazy. Do it. Uh, Here we go. Joyful, joyful, Lord, we adore thee. And in my life, I put none before thee. And since I was a youngster, I came to know that you were the only way to go. So I had to grow and come to an understanding that I'm down with the king. And now I'm demanding. So you tell me who you down with, see? Because all I know is that I'm down with G-O-D. You down with G-O-D? You down with G-O-D? You down with G-O-D? Who's down with G-O-D? Come on, let's go. What? Y'all grew up like me, I love it. So imagine my surprise when I walk into Victory Campus Ministries for the first time and there's a, a guy with long hair and a beard Cargo shorts and some rainbows, and he's sitting on a stool, and he's got his guitar, and he starts singing, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. (laughs) And I'm like, no, Lord, don't open my eyes. Close the eyes of my heart, Lord. I don't want to see this. Talking about better is one day in your courts. And I'm like, this is not a better day in your courts, Lord Jesus. What am I doing here today? Man, and I struggled big time. I wanted to leave. Listen, I was the only black guy in that place. It was like seven or eight of us. 
That was the only, I might have been the only black person that these guys ever knew. We're not talking like, we're not talking like Pastor Tiffany, like white person, right? <laughs> Can I just say that? Can I say that? I'm just being real. <laughs> we're not talking, pa- I said it, I said it now. I'm going to get fired, but I'm okay. I'm just going to say it. We're not talking that kind of, we're talking like, we're talking like the backwoods country of North Carolina in the mountains where there really, there is no one that looks like me in their town. And so I'm the only person that they know, and I'm the only person that looks like me that that's there, right? And it's, it is hard. And I am, I am trying to worship. Now I can worship to those songs, right? Because it's different. But, but I was, I was wrestling and struggling and I was, but I was staying, and then I was bringing my friends, and one by one, I would bring my friends to that place. And then one by one, I would lose a friend. Every time I brought them, <laughs> they, just stopped, they just stopped coming. They said, no, we're not. No, bro, I can't, I can't come there. And it was, it was a struggle, but I, but I stayed. And something began to happen as I stayed. As I began to say, you know what? These friends are gone. They're no longer there. But it was no longer about basketball. It was no longer about girls. It was no longer about superficial things. It was all about Jesus. And these guys were all about Jesus. And I wanted to know about about Jesus. And so I started chasing after these guys. I know about Jesus. And I'm telling you, my life was transformed. In those moments, that's when I got baptized. That's when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. That's when I began to evangelize and prophesy. And my life was changed. And that's where, man, God showed up in so many ways. And the old Jermaine was gone. And the new Jermaine was here. And people didn't recognize me. It was because I had Cho- I, had, I had chosen to stay, chosen to stay, and my life was changed. Now, listen, the crazy part about it is when I left the ministry, I left NC State, the ministry was like 80% black, <laughs> and I still married a white girl. Ain't that crazy? <clears throat> it's nuts. It's nuts, man. <laughs> I don't even know where I'm at right now. Um, <laughs> but listen, the disciples, the, the, disciples, the disciples chose to stay. And that, and that became a marker for the early church. They stayed together. You know, we'll read this passage again. If we can put it up on the screen, this is Acts chapter 2, 44 through 47. Listen, just, and I'll just read it, but listen to the, to the words here. And you can hear how the disciples staying became a marker for Everyone else stand together. It says all the believers were together, and they had everything in common. They sold their property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. It says the Lord added to their number daily. They were marked by togetherness. Their ability to choose to stay was remarkable. I mean, and we'll talk about it here in a little bit, but they were, they were marked by their choice. But another choice I want to talk about tonight is them choosing not just to stay, but them choosing to give. And their, their choice to give and their generosity that they, was, they displayed towards one another is really one of, them, one of the most amazing things that you can read in um, the New Testament. And here's a little context for what, what's happening here. There are Jews from everywhere, from all over, and they've come for um, a celebration. And they, they, end up in, <laughs> they end up in a Pentecostal worship service, right? <laughs> and, and, and people are, are speaking in tongues, and, and people are waving flags, and it's going, it's going crazy. And, and they, they, they see God for the first time in their life, and they, they come to know him. And what happens is, they don't want to leave. They've come to visit, and now they're staying because they, they want more of God. And so they're just, they're just saying, we're going to figure it out. I don't know how we're going to do it, but we're going to figure it out. But what's happening here in this passage is the, the other people that, that stay there and people that have come from other places are saying, you know what? I don't want you to leave either. I want you to get more of God. Because this God is awesome, and I want you to grow in God. So what I'm, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take my possessions, and I'm going to take them, and I'm going to pawn them, sell them, hawk them. I'm going to put it on eBay, Facebook Marketplace. I'm going to figure out some way for me to make some money, not just for myself, 
but I want to make some money so that I can support you and support your growth in God. I want you to stay. And this is a, an amazing picture of what it looks like to choose to stay and to choose to give. And it's so radical to me. And the question I was asking is, why would these people be so radical in the way that they give? Why would they give in, in such a way? And I had this revelation as I was reading this, this entire passage in context. And it's this. A forgiven people are a giving people. And I'll say that again. A forgiven people are a giving people. Now listen, this is what I mean by that. Since they, they gave radically because they had been forgiven in a radical way. You read Acts 2, 36 through 39, Peter preaches this message and he says, Therefore, let all of Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And then when the apostles heard this, they were, they were, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and to the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Listen to Peter's message. It is so strong. And it pricked their heart. It's, it's, it's something that they heard and they, and they were they were moved. They, they had killed God. Think about that. They're, they are in this place where Jesus Christ is God. And they have put him on a cross and they have killed him. Could you imagine the, the shame and the guilt and, and all of the things and the angst that is going on in their soul? And you can see it in their response. Oh, God, what are we going to do? How do we fix this problem? And Peter's response to them is the, really the first gospel message in the Bible. It's, it's, or at least in Acts and through the church, it is repent. Be baptized in the forgiveness of your sins in Jesus Christ our Lord and receive the gift of his Holy Spirit. Could you imagine what that, what, what, are, you, what are you saying? You're saying, I'm, I'm forgiven? Are you, are you saying that, that, He's wiping it away. He's not, he's not going to burn this whole thing to the ground with me in it, but he is forgiving me. He is, he is loving me. He is saying that he wants me. He wants me to know him. He wants to pour out his spirit on me. Can you imagine what they would have felt in that moment? It was unbelievable forgiveness that they had seen and had heard, and they had come to the revelation of the grace of Jesus Christ in that moment. And they were forgiven. They were moved. They, they knew forgiveness in that moment like no one had ever heard before. Or at least for them, that no one that they knew or them themselves had ever felt in that moment, but they had the grace put upon them to know what real forgiveness was, what God's mercy was. And it's that that informed the way that they gave to each other. Like, how can I not be generous towards others when God has been so generous towards me? Man, and Peter's message is the same for us today, right? My sins killed Jesus. Your sins killed Jesus. We crucified Christ. We don't like to think about it in that way, but if we were there, that would have been us saying, crucify this man. And here we are today saying, what are we going to do, God? with our sin. And God says, you don't have to do anything. I've done it for you. You didn't kill me. I died for you. I got on the cross for you. And now you have been forgiven. And now you can receive my love and you can receive my grace and you can receive my spirit and you can, you can know me. This is the gospel. And I, listen, I know that some of you in here know that you know that you know that, man, while you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. And I feel like somebody in here should be giving God a big round of applause, a big hallelujah, a thank you. A thank you for your grace, God. A thank you for your mercy, God. A thank you, God, that you see me. Thank you, God, that you found us. Thank you, God, that you love us. Thank you, God, for your mercy. God, we thank you, Lord, that you've forgiven us. 
We're forgiven. We're forgiven. You are forgiven. That's a, that's a message for somebody here today to hear. God forgives you. God forgives you. And it's, it is that forgiveness that informs how we ought to treat one another. God's forgiveness expressed towards us should transform the way we give our time, our energy, our resources to others in the same way it did the early church. Listen, because understanding the gravity of how much you've been forgiven and the mercy of God should change how you view yourself. And the, the way that we view ourselves directly affects how we treat and how we view other people. And so, family, if you are in this place and you're struggling to find value in the people of God, and you're struggling with this idea that people of God don't value you, if you're struggling connecting to a small group, <laughs> joining a service team, and all of these things are, are difficult and challenges for you, it is possible that you haven't fully wrestled with the grace and the mercy of God in your life. Paul says it like this, and I'm almost done, I promise. Paul says it like this in Romans 12 and 3. It says, for the grace, of, the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to you. Paul is saying with everything that he has as an apostle, and he's saying, he's saying, look, look, don't think of yourself in such a high way. And he's saying, I know that you guys are prideful people and we, we are either arrogant or we are, we are insecure. And that's, that's what pride looks like. But what pride really says is, I don't need you and you don't need me. But Paul says, if, if you allow yourself to view yourself through the mercy of God, that is the lens that breaks down every single barrier and it levels the playing field. That you need Jesus, I need Jesus, we need Jesus, right? I am not less than, I am not more than, I need Jesus. Man, look at your neighbor right now and say, I am not less than. I am also not more than. And you need Jesus. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> listen we, all, we, all, we all need Jesus, but we all need the body of Jesus Christ too. And the body of Christ is his people. You need his people, his people need you. You look at how the early church lived this out. They, they gave so much because they had been forgiven so much. Not just money, but time and energy and space. They gave away their resources so that others could get close to the source. They gave away their comfort and convenience and they chose community. They gave away their property, and they chose people. They gave away material and temporary and chose eternal. And this is where we are, family, that God has given us so much. And this place should be a place where a forgiven people forgive people, where loved people love people, where blessed people bless people, where justified people shows mercy towards other people, where people who have been seen by God can see the value in other people, when people that have been pursued by Christ when we were running the other way will pursue other people. Forgiven people should choose to give. This is my second of three closings here. Um, <laughs> Acts 2.47 says this, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord added to their number. Listen, as they stayed together and as they gave, the Lord added. I believe today that God still wants to add to us. But it really is going to take us staying together. It's going to take us choosing to give of ourselves to one another both individually and corporately. I mean, God wants to pour out his spirit on this house. He wants to propel us into our purpose, push us into mission. He wants to do something great with each and every one of us, both individually and corporately. And I, I believe God wants to do that when we come together in unity. 
For some of us, it's going to start with you choosing this people and saying, I want to, I want to be with this people. I believe that's when God is going to begin to open up doors that you've never seen before in your life. When you're going to go from an empty house to a full house. And this is my last closing here tonight. You know, <laughs> is, that, is that the Oscar thing where they turn the music on and get you off stage? It's too late. I got the mic. I'm not going anywhere. Um, but, but I'm really going to, I'm going to close here. Um, you know, in Luke chapter 1, there's this story, a beautiful story of, of family and community. Mary has found out she's, she's pregnant with God's baby, <laughs> with Jesus. And she runs to her cousin, Elizabeth. She calls out her name, Elizabeth. I mean, Elizabeth heard, hears Mary call her name. What was being birthed inside of her began to move, and it leapt in her belly. And then she began to prophesy as she was filled with the Spirit of God. And as she began to prophesy over Mary, Mary begins to, and as, as you read it, it's, it is so amazing and so beautiful. It's one of the, the best kind of songs and psalms about, about Jesus that, that you could, about God that you could ever read. And it is beautiful, but it's all kind of in the context of community, that what was being birthed in and her and Mary and what was being birthed in Elizabeth was all being kind of moved and propelled and, and pushed. And they were being encouraged because they got connected with one another. And that is what I sense tonight in some of us is there is uh, something being birthed in each and every single one of us. And the question that I have is, like, will you allow yourself to get connected to the people of God that he's put around you so that he can bring about what he wants to birth through you and through this house. And I love it when you read this passage. It says in verse 59 of that, 55, or I'm sorry, 56 of that passage. It says, but Mary stayed with Elizabeth. For three months. But Mary stayed. Family, will you stay? Will you connect? Will you linger in the lobby? Will you join a small group? Will you join a service team? Will you come down front and ask for prayer? <laughs> like, will you call a friend? Will you sign up for a discipleship? Like, will you stay? And will you choose to give? Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much. Thank you for what you're birthing in these in this people and everyone here. God, I thank you that you are doing a work in every single one of us. That there's purpose in every single one of us. And God, I thank you that tonight decisions are being made. to move and get connected into this family, to get connected in some family. But decisions are being made not to, to run away anymore, but to go towards their Jerusalem where they would find you, they would find your spirit, they would be filled with your spirit, they would be filled with hope and filled with love and filled with purpose. And I thank you tonight. That's what you're doing in this place. And I pray, God, that you would help us by your grace to choose to stay and choose to give. God, I thank you for your word tonight. Help us all in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Thank you, family.